Good morning. You probably know who I am, but if, for those who may not know, my name's Gary, Gary Pattymore. It was about five weeks ago that um, Barry asked me to speak on Sunday morning. I don't think either of us expected it to be on camera, and this is the first time in my life I've ever preached to a camera. So um, please bear with me. I've been uh, threatened by my wife that, that I must not tell any jokes uh, and I must not do my Winston Churchill impression. Um, so um, if I do slip into that, you'll have to forgive me uh, because I can be quite a disobedient husband sometimes, but there we go. I wanted to talk about a proverb, one of the Proverbs, Proverbs chapter nine, verse 10. Proverbs says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. So I wanted to unpack that a bit, about this thing about fear of the Lord. What's this fear? If you look in the dictionary, it says fear is an emotion induced by perceived danger. It's uh, an emotion of perceived danger or a threat. And fear causes you to do many things, but three of the main things that it will cause you to do is that you either freeze, or you fight, or you flee. The three Fs, as you might say. It's a sort of safety mechanism. It's not necessarily bad, therefore, because um, it makes you more careful. If you become frightened about something, you tend to be more careful. Um, it might stop you doing dangerous things. Um, it helps you to avoid accidents. Those are sort of all negative things. It um, also might cause you to freeze. You know, the uh, idea of the rabbit caught in the headlamps sort of thing. Terror. You freeze. And then in that situation, you don't deal with the problem. You just continue to um, worry about it and you might even get worse because if you're if you're in a sort of situation perhaps in a driving lesson and you get frightened you get a bit terrorized by the traffic and everything then you'll do worse than if you were calm one of the other perspectives on this is to think about um, what you're afraid of fears can be imaginary there might be nothing actually there but you're afraid you might be exaggerated fear you know spiders in Britain are pretty harmless but if you're anything like me I don't like spiders but they are mostly harmless and of course because I'm saying mostly some of you are thinking yeah but there's the odd one that isn't so you know it could be irrational hands up if you're afraid of bananas um, that would be quite irrational, wouldn't it? But there are people with these strange phobias and fears that, uh, to most of us, we recognize them as being totally irrational. There's the fear of pain, which is perfectly sensible, and the fear of harm. Again, very sensible um, worry and fear. But in this verse that we're looking at, it talks about the fear of the Lord. What is this fear? Is it, is it this cringing sort of terror, this being scared of God? Is that what it's trying to convey to us? I don't think so. I think it's talking about having an awesome respect, a, a sort of submission to, uh, as you recognize how great God is, then you submit and you stand in awe. The emphasis is a positive one a, and it's based on this belief in God. In order to be afraid of something you have to have some understanding of it. You know that uh, you know how this thing is going to react. You might have a fear of snakes and that fear is based on the knowledge that you have that snakes uh, can bite and some snakes when they bite you will poison you and you could actually die that knowledge produces that sort of fear I remember being in Australia once we were on a, our first visit there we went to a, a place near the beach and we walked along this path and just 
on the side of the path was this brown snake. And we went, ooh, look at that brown snake, you know, interesting. And we looked at it for a second or two and then walked off. And afterwards we were told it was a brown something or other and it was one of the most poisonous snakes in Australia. Had we known that in advance, I don't think we'd have stood there and admired it within about two feet of it. I think we'd have backed off a lot quicker. Now this verse that we're looking at <coughs> talks about fearing the Lord. In order to believe, in order to fear something, you have to believe that it exists, of course. Uh, you might fear the dark, but it's not actually darkness you fear. It's, it's rather the, um, what might be lurking in the dark. Or that you might fall into a deep hole as you stumble along in the dark. Or bump into a sharp object or something. It's the fear, really, of the unknown. So begin with this fear of the Lord. This awesome respect of an existing God. You could expand that to an awesome respect of an existing but unknown God, unknown to me. Or you could expand it again, an awesome respect of an existing but unknown God that I do not yet know. That's the start. That's the beginning of wisdom. Oh, hang on a minute. What's wisdom? What's wisdom? Again, if you look in the dictionary, it will tell you that it's having experience, it's having knowledge, and it's good judgment, it's sensibleness, if that's such a word. It's the capacity to make good use of the knowledge that you gain. So that's wisdom. It's not knowledge as such. It's not the same as knowledge. Wisdom is not the same as knowledge. You can have all the learning and knowledge in the world, if you like, and still be quite stupid. Because if you're not using that knowledge properly, you're actually being foolish. There's an old saying that if ignorance is bliss, it's foolish to be wise. And you know what? That's not true. A few years ago, there was that great big earthquake out in the Far East and it produced that tsunami. And they've got video f footage of people on the beach noticing that the water had gone out further than it had ever gone out before. Unusual, uniquely. And some people went down on the beach to look at what had been previously totally hidden by the water. They went down. They had no grasp in that moment of what was about to happen. They were ignorant of what was about to take place. And then you see the water come rushing in and the dreadful consequences of that. Ignorance in that situation was certainly not bliss. So you have to get some knowledge. So here's the process, if you like. Number one, do you believe in God? Number two, do you have an awesome respect for God? Have you got any respect for God? How do you get respect for God? Number three, learn about him so that you can get some more understanding of God. Well, okay, now you've got that understanding, what's next? You need to apply that understanding and you need to apply it to your own life. You need to learn from your own experience, learn from the experiences of others. We've got to be teachable so that you can learn to apply your knowledge appropriately. Now, if you're like me, you sometimes find it hard to gain knowledge. I, I, I know uh, two brothers one of them, um, in order to get his exams and uh, pass his A-levels and so on, he had to study like mad. He would spend hours with his books, he would study like mad. And he struggled and struggled, but by doing it that way, he would pass his exams and he did well. 
His brother would read the books once the night before the exam. It was there, he'd sit the exam and he'd sail through it. Sadly seems fair, but he achieved the same end. Some of us find it hard to retain knowledge and to gain knowledge. And the Bible has the answer again. It says, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask God for it. It's James 1 verses 5 to 8. And God gives liberally and without reproach, it says. So it's, there's no shame in asking God for wisdom. We all know the story of Solomon and how he asked God for wisdom. And God blessed him, didn't he? But later on, he didn't use that wisdom very wisely. But that's another story. Let's get back to this verse. This fear, this awesome respect for God, is actually just the beginning of wisdom. It's not like you've arrived. There's another verse that says, a fool says in his heart, there is no God. The Bible is quite straight about that. If you don't believe in God, if you do not believe there is a God, then you are a fool. That's what the Bible says. So, believe in God. John 14 verse 1 says, Do not let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe in me also. Now this is Jesus speaking. Jesus aligns himself there in that verse directly with God. He declares himself to be God. In order for mankind to be able to relate to God, God himself became a man. This man, Jesus. God made man. So now we're beginning to get some understanding. If we can get some understanding of Jesus and what his life and death meant, we can come into a relationship with God himself. But, there's always a but, isn't there? It's possible to believe in God and even have an awesome respect for him and yet not have a relationship with him. I believe in Elizabeth II, Queen of Britain and Ireland and the Empire and the Commonwealth and all the rest of it. But do you know what? I have no actual personal relationship with her at all. I've got the utmost respect for her. I, I honour her. But I've got no relationship with her. And it's the same with God. You can believe in God whatever you might call him. You can have an awesome respect for him. You can even try and live a good life and all of that, and yet not have a relationship with him. Let me share you a little bit about my own personal experience of that. My childhood fear, all through my childhood and through my early teens, was the fear of hell. I therefore had enough knowledge, no, not therefore, but because I had enough knowledge, I tried to be good. I had enough knowledge about um, the Bible to try and be good. I tried to outbalance my bad bits, my bad side, with the good things that I could do. I had been taught enough, because I went to Sunday school all through my childhood, um, I had a God-fearing grandmother. My, a lot of my family were in the local chapel where we attended. And I knew a lot about God. I knew the old hymns, we sang them regularly. I knew about God. But my uh, grasp on this was that it was all about the balance, the scales. If I did enough good, I'd go to heaven. And if I did too much bad, I'd go to hell. And I had this fear, therefore, of dying. If um, the old expression, if you fall under a bus, where would you go? Would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? That was my experience, my understanding of it, my grasp of it. I feared dying. There was all this uncertainty. And I got to the age of 18. And 
I found myself in church one night. Uh, a friend of mine had uh, told me he was going to this particular church and I invited myself along and we went uh, at 6.30 Sunday evening, Hebron Pentecostal Church in Cumbran, South Wales. I was sat in the back row, the first seat you get to when you're coming through the door, so that I could get out quick if I wanted to. And I listened to this man speaking. He was a, a big man, I remember. He had a dark suit on. He had a shock of white hair. And he preached the message with, well, three words of it stuck in my mind and still remain. He said, put God first in your life. And it was almost like this guy was speaking to me. I sat there and he talked about fearing uh, hell. He talked about uh, trying to be good. And he explained that while trying to be good is a good thing, um, the thing you must do is put God first in your life. And he invited everyone there to put their hand up if they wanted to come to know the Lord, to ask the Lord into their life and admit that they couldn't do it on their own. They needed Christ to save them. And I put my hand up, it was the traditional appeal. I put my hand up, he then asked us to stand to our feet. I stood to my feet and then he prayed and then he invited those who had stood, and there were several of us actually, to go forward and we were um, counseled as they called it. And I remember very clearly understanding for the first time that I was now safe from hell. That was my prime concern and had been for many years and now I was safe from hell. I realized I couldn't do it myself. It's all about Jesus and the cross. And that fear left me. I can remember it so clearly, the peace came into my heart and mind at that point. I just wanted to smile all the time. So peace had come and the fear had gone. That was the beginning of wisdom. So what happens next? Well, you don't at that point know it all. I certainly didn't know it all. I didn't have even the questions at that point. It was sort of fairly simple and basic. I'd been a fearful of hell. I'd understood now that it was Christ who took my sin on the cross and I was saved. So that was like the beginning. But I didn't have many questions initially. But as a newborn baby, as the Bible puts it, um, being born again, you start to grow. And as you start to grow, you get knowledge of the holy, is the way that the scriptures put it. It's, you begin to understand a bit more about God. You begin to learn about Jesus. And gradually, that escape from hell turns into more of a longing for heaven, if you like. You know the idea of, if you, if you, <laughs> went out in a boat and you, you fell in a sea and you started to drown. Um, the lifeboat comes along and it, it pulls you out of the water and right, that's your initial reaction, it's relief. I'm now saved from this, uh, from, from death. That's your initial reaction. Within a short time afterwards, and it varies from people to people, person to person, you would begin to be grateful to the ones that pulled you out. And you might even keep up the connection there. You might join the Lifeboat Institute or you, you might even volunteer to become uh, a member of the, the Lifeboat. But you would, re you would respond from that saving, that salvation, with gratitude. And you probably want to get to know more about the persons and the organisation, perhaps in that case, that saved you. So, replacing the fear of hell as the motivation to get saved now changes to an appreciation of God who set this all up and a love of God. In Philippians chapter 1 verses 9 to 10, the Message Bible sums this up um, in a very clear way. 
Before I read it, I, I just want to go back slightly and just go back to the original verse again and, and make this point. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's the beginning of wisdom for anybody. There's two categories of people, basically. There are people who are saved by God and going to heaven, and there are people who are not saved and are not going to heaven. And the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom for both categories. To you who might be watching and have not asked the Lord into your life, I would appeal to you now to, to begin to show an awesome respect for God and accept him, ask him into your life, receive him as your Lord and Saviour. For those of us who are Christians, who have done this already, our responsibility is to show our gratitude to God. We do this by worshipping him. We do this by honouring his name. And we do this by trying to be obedient to the things he's instructed us to do. So Philippians chapter 1 verses 9 to 10. This is how it's summed up in the Message Bible. And I'm going to read it so I don't get it wrong. So this is my prayer, that your love will flourish and that you will not only love much, but well. Learn to love appropriately. You need to use your head and test your feelings so that your love is sincere and intelligent, not sentimental gush. Live a lover's life circumspect and exemplary a life jesus will be proud of bountiful in fruits of the soul making jesus christ attractive to all getting everyone involved in the glory and the praise of god i couldn't have summed it up better myself so let's pray Father, we thank you for this great sacrifice you made on the cross. We thank you, Lord, that you had this plan before the, even the creation of the world. We thank you, Lord, that you put into all men a certain amount of fear. And we pray that, Lord, that fear will turn into more of an awesome respect of who you are and what you've done. Help us to respond to that not by freezing and doing nothing, but by being motivated to get right with you. Father, I pray for those who have not yet received you into their life, that this morning they will do that. Lord Jesus, come into our hearts, come into our lives, save our souls, we pray. And for those of us who have already prayed that prayer, we ask you, Lord, to draw us closer to you, Help us, Lord, to honour you, to live lives that are pleasing to you. Help us to worship you. Help us to honour you. Help us to trust you, whatever may come. And we thank you, Lord, that you have said that all things work together for good for those that love you. So in whatever circumstances, whatever trying times we're going through, we know that we can look to you and trust you and that you will care for us. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name.